Let's look at that one.
No, there's... Okay, yo. All right. Hey, let's, let, yo, let's get started. So, um, yo, we have a big, big class today. Yo, big, big, big class. <laughs> this guy. So, can you, uh, yo, bring, bring, it, bring it down. We, we're going to make three quick announcements. Yo, hang on. They're going to be short, bro. Three quick announcements, and then we're going to do the quiz, and then we're going to have class. Yo, but can you, no, go to the next one. Actually, go back. Um, I'm going to do this announcement. So tonight, no, you can stay up here, bro. Uh, even though it's for Korea, but it's all good. It's the same. Korea, China, whatever. Hey, so this is uh, the Korean, yo, tonight there is this um, king of mass singer. So if you have a singing voice, you have a good singing voice, you could win 200 bucks. And uh, it's, it's in 10 sparks. It's going to be a cool event. So you get, they get a feel for Korean culture. Anyway, I want to put that out there. And it's also going to be really entertaining. I was going to be a judge, but I can't. I'm leaving town, so I can't. All right, next slide. Dude, and what it, tell us what this is. Oh, wait. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm James from Chinese Undergraduate Student Association. So this Sunday, we'll having an event named Long's Tale, A Journey Through Chinese Culture at Hot Alumni Hall from 5.30 to 9 p.m. So we're introducing Chinese traditional festivals with different, different stations, uh, such as I'm, I'm in charge of the long table, where I'm introducing like how did long come from, what it means, and we're also having games to win prize. So in my table, it's like picking up marbles with chopsticks, just like we, we guys did last week in the class. Only more difficult. Yeah, more difficult. And we're also having performances, including shadow puppetries and Chinese traditional folk music and dances. So if you guys are interested in that, you can follow the, you can scan the QR code to follow our Instagram account, or you can come to us at hub table number four tomorrow from 12 to 4 p.m. for more information. Thank Dude, you. Thanks, man. It's a good chance to really introduce yourself a little bit to Chinese culture, bro. Yeah. All right, thanks, bro. All right, final announcement. Hi, we are here to um, recruit for Center Helps. It's the local um, helpline here in State College. Um, it's a really cool um, program. Um, we help with um, basic needs calls, um, counseling, and short-term counseling, and we're also the local 988 phone line for s suicide. Um, and feel free to like just do it even if you aren't um, psych or like RHS um, in our most recent training class we had like an engineering major we had um, someone in BBH so uh, don't feel like you have to be in psych or anything like that to volunteer but but it, can I say something so this is suicide prevention yes everyone in the classroom has been touched by suicide in some way mm -hmm. Right? Yes. I want to say that. So if you feel like, hey, I would really be interested in learning more, participating more, being part of it, it's very cool. So just go to centerhelps.org and get more information. Cool? Yes. All right. Thanks, ma'am. Yo, thank you, dude. Thank you. All right. Mr. Moore. Yes, sir. You can. What's that? Quiz. Oh yeah, the quiz. Can you do get you do the quiz? All right.
Hey, don't send the code to anybody, by the way. All right, hey, so listen up. Um, are we good, everybody? You got a selfie if you didn't get on, we're good? All right, we have a, uh, this, we have a, a, a really s s special class um, because my Philadelphia brother is here today. Uh, can you introduce yourselves though, first off? Hi guys, my name is James and I'm a sophomore. I study cybersecurity and I'm originally from Philadelphia. All right. Uh, hey guys, I'm Diego. I'm, I'm a junior studying computer science uh, and I am from the Dominican Republic. Hi, my name is Veronica. I'm a sophomore in marketing and I was born outside of Philly but I grew up in Mississippi. Awesome. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. The three of you are gonna ask questions of this gentleman right here. And any question you wanna ask, any question. Anything. Once he starts answering, you're gonna realize, okay, I can ask any question at all, okay? And what we want you to do is find out as much about him, his life story, but also more the way he sees the world because this guy right here, he's got a lot of wisdom. And, uh, and every semester, for the past couple of years, he shows up to 119 uh, with Cora. It was with Fred, now it's Cora. And is part of, so it's 119. So, whoa. Hey, don't be up against the wall back there, right? Whoever's next to the wall. We good? All right. So, let me say, st I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give the basic rundown and then they're gonna start with the question. Wait, you can say hello first, like. <laughs> hello to everyone. Is this on? Yeah, it's on, push it up, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sam always tells me not to say that and I can't ever wait not to say it, so I say it. <laughs> can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? If you can, then hello. It's a pleasure being here. All right, Urban, Urban Moore, grew up in Philadelphia at the young age of, dang man, 12 or 13 you started to get pulled to the streets. Even though this guy, part of the reason he got pulled to the streets is because he was so smart and brilliant and insightful and all those things. I'm not gonna say much more because the hat won't fit, but, uh, <laughs> And then by the age, what time were you when you went in for 21, right? 22? Uh, 22. At the age of 22, your age. your age, the age of many of you, Irvin committed a crime <laughs> that landed him in the state penitentiary, first at Greaterford and then at Rockview, right up the road, for 52 years. 52 years, okay? And I met Irvin through my wife, who met Irvin because we were taking some Social 119 World in Conversation students into the prison to have conversations with the lifers. In, in Pennsylvania, when you get a life sentence, life is life. That means that's it. So they put you in the ground, you're gonna be in prison. That's not the case with Irvin. So that's interesting right there. My wife, you met Lori, and when Lori met you about 15 years ago, she said, oh, this guy, <laughs> this guy. I gotta, I, gotta be, I gotta meet this guy more, you know what I mean? More, more, M-O-R-E, I gotta get a better, I wanna spend time with this guy. So over the next years, you and Lori corresponding, Lori, Lori visiting, Lori and I visiting, I mean, all sorts of taking more students out. And uh, this, this, Irvin 
was the man with the wisdom and really a special human being, which is why he's sitting here today, because he's a special human being. Not everybody gets out, but Irvin got out. And, uh, and so the goal is to introduce you to get to know him, this really special person who, by the way, lives over behind like that Burger King over on University Drive. So at the end of class today, if you ever want to go hang out with him, that's where you'll find him over there, you know. Just, uh, all right. But, you, but, you know, it'll be, it's hard to get in touch with him because his phone never stops ringing. Okay, that's it, my friends. Irvin? Yes, sir. They're going to start with some questions. Indeed. So, so who's going to start? What's the first question you have for me? Yeah, you're on, any of you, man. Um, I, don't, I don't remember if Sam said you got life sentence. I can't hear you. Did you get life sentence or? Did I get a life sentence? Yeah. I had a life sentence uh, when I was 22 years old, unintentionally, and I want you to understand that word because I had no intent for this to happen but I was involved in a, in a crime where someone lost their life. Uh, we, didn't mean this for the, we didn't mean for this to happen, but it did. And as a result of that, I was arrested, I was tried, I was convicted in a court of law and found guilty. This was in 1969. And there was so much happening in 1969 in our society, in our culture, as a lot of you historians and people who understand history know, the 1960s was a time of tumultuous and climactic change on pretty much all levels, economic, political, cultural. The music was changing, the colors were changing, the architecture was changing. There was a surge amongst the inner cities for growth and development and awareness of self. So black power began to rear its head. Uh, the anti-war anti -war movement was prevalent because we were in Vietnam fighting. The women's live movement itself began to raise its fledgling head. Mr. Moore, at this rate, we're gonna get three questions in, my friend. <laughs> but see, Sam understands that I am a storyteller. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I am a talker, is what I do. I deliver messages, history, politics, through what I say. Now, I'm going to answer some questions. I'm going to get quite a few questions answered today. But Sam also understands this, that I do things my way. That's just who I am. I am 78 years old. I've earned this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yes, I was given a life sentence, and uh, what many of you may not be familiar with is that in Pennsylvania, the judge does not have to say, I sentenced you to life without the benefit of parole because in Pennsylvania, there has never been parole for lifers. It's one of the things that we're still fighting for today because in other the majority of other states in the United States, a person who's sentenced to life may do 13 years, 15 years, 20 to life, 25 to life, but in Pennsylvania, life is until you die. Unless you're fortunate enough and blessed enough and have made enough of an impact on the system that someone says, wait a minute, he's better served and we're better served by him being home, by him being out. So that's what happened to me and I was able to uh, make commutation. So next question. You mentioned that you were arrested in the 60s and that was a time, as you said, uh, of a lot of, there was a lot of changes, there was a lot of cultural boom happening. How was it living through that in prison? Oh, good Lord. 
Uh, when I went to prison in 1969, have any of you guys either seen the movie or read the book, The Shawshank Redemption? If you have, raise your hands. So quite a few of you have read that. Well, prison was like that times 100 or more because prison was dark, dank, dirty, and dangerous. There were no books other than the Bible in your cell. No books. There was no radio, no TV. And no radio, having no radio means what? No music. Can you imagine being in an, an, an environment where there's no music? And if you sang or hummed, you might get your head beat in by the guards. Shut up. AF0768, shut that noise up. It was a place unimaginable to today's standards. There was no school. There was no library. So that's what happened when I went to prison. But out in the real world, which is what we call the outside world, the real world, things were happening so fast and so tumultuously that we had to be impacted on the inside. There's a segue. When I went to prison in 1969, there were seven penitentiaries in the entire state. I recall at 17 years old, marching around City Hall in Philadelphia, where I'm from, with the Black Power Movement, before the Black Panthers, we had something called the Revolutionary Action Movement, or RAM, and the Black Guards. The Black Liberation Army, BLA, Seminese Liberation Army. We had those kinds of, of entities that were now beginning to sprout in the inner cities, in the urban areas. At this time, there was, no, there was no such thing as black studies. None, no such, no such word. African-American history, no such thing. So having grown up, not in the 60s, I grew up in the 50s. You know, in the 40s I was born, in the 50s I started to step out, five, six, seven, eight years old. In the 60s I was full flung in the midst of everything that was happening. And that was also during the civil rights movement, the civil rights area, when things began to open up and we had the first wave of young black men and women leaving our communities, going to, where were they going? Right here. They're going to the universities and the colleges around the country. For the first time in my life, we had you guys coming back home and teaching us the histories that we never knew anything about, teaching us about us. All I had known about, I am African American, as you can probably tell, but all I knew about me and my people was that we were from Africa initially. We were enslaved and brought to transatlantic slave trade, brought to America. We had never contributed one iota to the growth and development of the history of civilization. That's what we were taught. And that's what we believed. Now the young people that started coming back to our community saying, wait a minute, we're, longing, we're learning about Song Gay. We're longing, learning about Timbuktu. We're learning about Mansa Musa and kings and queens of the motherland. We're learning about civilization, the Nubian, Kush, things that we had no idea about. And it instilled, began to instill in us a sense of identity that we grabbed onto that had never existed prior to this point. They began to teach us that we were a part of the human race and that our responsibility was to humanity, all of us. Uh, next, next question before Sam walks over here and says, stop lecturing. Next question. Hang on while you're asking your question. Okay. 
Can you hear me in the back? They can't. Okay. You're good. All right, Veronica. When it gets to the point where you can't hear me, raise your hand and make some sort of movement so I'll understand and know that Sam is right and you couldn't hear me. I tend to speak loud. Having spoken in the penitentiary for decades where we had no microphones and there were, where there were thousands of voices always. Oh, can you imagine the clamor in places like that where everyone wants to be heard and they're angry and arrogant and aggressive. I had to learn to speak loudly, forcefully, and I tend to do that. So, another question, please. Um, I know you've been talking about like all the changes in society, like while you were in prison, since you went in at such a young age and came out like 52 years later. Do you remember like a specific moment when you got out where you really realized you're like, wow, like there's so much that's different? <laughs> oh, that's every day. Dude, that's a that's beautiful every question. day of my yeah. life, and I love it. When I left. There was no such thing as personal computers. They had computers, but one computer may have been as large as this room. And for its operation, I believe it was called ENIAC, and it was run by maybe the uh, United States government or NASA or IBM, or, but there was no such thing as personal computers. I said there was no television when I went into prison. And this was 1969, the year that man walked on the moon. July 20th, I went in prison on July 18th. And this happened July 20th, and I didn't find out that man walked on the moon until three years later. That's how far we moved we were from the real world. We had no radio, we had no TV, we had no books. There were no periodicals, there was no magazines, there was no newspapers. We didn't talk to the guards, they did not talk to us. I said it was a hostile environment. It was like being in another world. So dark. I think about it now and then I shudder and shiver and say, oh no. How did I get through that? But I did. Again, I say there was change occurring out here in the larger society, and that change impacted us on the inside. We went through there as young fellas from the urban community that were different from the guys that had gone through decades and decades prior to that, because penitentiaries have been in this country since the 1800s. When they first, and in Philadelphia, when they, when they first came up with the idea of penitentiaries or place of penance. This is something that the Quakers thought about, Puritans, they thought about. It says, as opposed to just chopping someone's hand off, blinding them, hanging them, putting them in a chair and then ducking them in the river until they drown, laying them on a slab and taking their entrails out an inch at a time, will put them in a place where they can get on their knees with a Bible in their cell and ask God for penitence. And these places will be called, will be called penitentiaries. You know, they thought they were doing something uh, humane. And I guess in comparison with the way it was prior to that point, it was to a degree. But they didn't understand the human psyche, the human psychology, and that these folk that were locked in these cells by themselves may eventually go insane. And that's what happened. So, Ir Irvin, I have a question. Pardon me? I have, I have something. When you said you didn't have TVs, you meant there weren't TV televisions in prison. Well, of Not course, outside. that's of course. Yeah, but listen, these oh, folks, no, they understand yeah, that. No, they don't understand. It's 1969. <laughs> these folks very well understand. When I said there were no TVs, I meant in prison. Of course, you understood that, right? I don't you know. did not think that there were no TVs in existence. <laughs> These are intelligent folk here, yeah, Sam. Well, dude, all right. I'll take These are students. These are scholars. <laughs> Listen, I want to tell them the story about when Lori and I, you had been out maybe 
12 hours or so. I got a mic. Oh, okay. You've been out like 12 hours? And we came and down to Johnstown, we took you to a Walmart super center. <laughs> I had heard about Walmart. <laughs> And I saw pictures of it. I'd seen it. We finally got television, y'all. So I finally started watching television. And I saw Walmart on television. I said, well, it was, uh, looks like a department store. But until Sam and Laurie took me to this Walmart in uh, Johnstown. Super center. A super center. And I stepped in his place and I just said, I looked around, I said, oh, Lord, look at this. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. And I'm walking around with the cart. They're piling stuff in the cart. Well, get this, get that, get this. And I'm just walking like this. And they're laughing. They're having fun. I wasn't having fun. I was astounded at what was here. I had come from a system where you could get your clothes changed once or twice a year. And that was just a little brown drab, a, 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 drown, a brown drab pair of pants, jacket, shirt, brown boots, a brown cloth hat, and a brown jacket. If you ever see me walking around State College, which you probably will do, you very seldom, sometimes you may, but very seldom see me having anything on the majority of my stuff being brown. Yeah. So I'm walking around this Walmart Super Center, and Sam is grabbing pants, we're grabbing a shirt, we're grabbing jackets. We're gra uh, but, tell, I, but tell him why. Because you, when you left prison, what did you have? Okay. You had nothing. Oh, well, no, it was me. It was the clothes I had on, which were a pair of sweatpants, uh, undershirt, and a sweat top. That was it. That's what I left. And a brown, the brown hat. The brown prison hat. That's what I left there with. And I left there, look, I had been incarcerated 52 years. I had accumulated, I had over 500 books in my cell. 500 books in a place where when I went there, they were no, there was no such thing as books. Because inside, I, I developed a thirst for doing what you guys are doing now, learning. I developed a thirst for knowledge. I understood when they said that knowledge is power, what they meant. They, don't, they did not mean knowledge is power enough to hit somebody in the head with. It means knowledge is power to the degree that you learn to control your world and your world being you. You learn who you are as an individual, as a human being, your strengths, your weaknesses, your capabilities. You learn about civics and how to live in a society. You learn about politics and policy and economics. You learn these things and these things give you power. And I didn't understand that prior to going to prison, having reached my highest grade reach was the ninth grade. I convinced my parents, my mother and father to sign me out of high school, uh, junior high school in the ninth grade. Why? Because what do I need to go to school for? I knew enough. 17 years old, I thought I knew enough. Foibles of youth. But it wasn't until I got inside and time started to pass and I realized I was hearing things that I didn't understand. I was fortunate enough to have some elders, some what we call old heads that were around me that were much more learned than I am. And I couldn't understand the concepts or nuances of what they were talking about. But I wanted to learn, I wanted more. So when we did finally at some point begin to get books on the inside and we asked for the development of a school GED, I took that and passed that and delved with both feet 
into learning any and everything that I could about any and everything. And I was amazed at the amount of knowledge in the world. I was amazed how little we knew about ourselves and about the universe. Again, I say, like you, I developed a thirst and a hunger for education. Because I knew how important it was. And I began to read. Let me give you a... Uh, Wait, we do have another question, my friend. Huh? We, have, we have about ten more. Okay. All right. We, are, we have enough time. We have enough time. <laughs> give me a question. So you say you have 500 books in your cells? 500. Yeah. How big was your cell at the time? Oh, my cell was crowded. With 500 books, it was crowded. This is a... How big no was it compared to, like, say, that screen? Well, there this is cell. a normal cell that's... Oh, my cell could have fit inside that screen. Um, I'm six feet tall. If I stretch my arms out, I could just about touch each wall. So that's how wide it is. It was about seven feet long. So in about maybe two and a half to three steps, I'm from the back of the cell to the front. In the cell was a bed, a sink, a toilet, a desk. That's it. That's it. So in that cell, I had to find some way to put 500 books, one at a time, or two or three at a time, because I fell such I fell in love with books to the extent that if I would see a book sitting on the radiator or a book sitting on the table that didn't belong to anyone, someone just put it there, I would grab it. So oh, another book. I take it back to my cell, and I begin setting my books up. It got to the point that the brothers used to come down to my cell and we would sit down and talk, discuss issues, or we'd they come down to get a book. And then we'd talk about it. But the story I was about to tell you is before I had any book, there was a ring of old heads, elders. I'm going to tell you about the elders before we finish this conversation, which we're having now. I want to tell you something about the elders. But there were elders here, guys that were older than I, and I'm from Philadelphia, the majority of people there were from Philadelphia. And if you didn't know this, Philadelphia is what they call a prize fighter's town. We got boxers that come out of Philadelphia, like Detroit, like New York, Chicago, other places. But Philadelphia is known for being able to fight with their hands. You know, uh, and all of our olders, all, all of our elders, all of our old heads could play. So the old heads used to stand around in a circle, which is the only way you could congregate in those days because you'd been not be in a group together more than three. So one guy's here, one guy's here, one guy's here. They're standing around in a circle and us young guys would just be walking by and, and they're standing there and they're in dialogue with each other about issues. And you see us tired, all right, all right, go ahead, get, get out of here. But I used to want to, I used to always like to hang around. I was curious. And I'm, li I'm getting little bits and pieces of what they're talking about. It could be some of anything. Astronomy, biology, economics, politics, history. And I'm, oh, I'm ease hustling, is what they call it. So one day I was there ease hustling, and one of my old heads said, er, 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 come here. I said, yeah, yeah, what's up? He said, why you, why you keep hanging around? I said, uh, uh He says, look, right now, you know this is the old head circle. You're not an old head. But this is what I want you to do. Because he saw the look of disappointment in my face. He said, take this book. Take it up to yourself. Read this book. Come back. Talk to us about it. Then we see what we can do. I said, okay, okay, okay. I grabbed the book. Huh? Walked down the block, go up the steps, go to my cell, open the door, took the book, threw it in the corner. I said, man, who they think? Read a book. So next day, I grabbed the book, go downstairs, walk to the circle, says, okay, here you go. My wife says, oh, you read that then, right? 
It's a gag, 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 gag. I said, okay, uh, how was it? I said, good book, good book. That's all I could say. He says, okay, tell me something about the protagonist. I didn't have the slightest idea what that meant. He said, the central character, tell me something about him. I hadn't read a word. And he gave me that look that I was familiar with, that old head Philadelphia look. He said, now look, take that book, take it upstairs and read it, or stay the, pardon my language, stay the F away from here. I grabbed the book, took it back, had my head down, walked with the steps stomping, like kids do. Got to myself, the door went in, sat on, my, you know I mean? sat on the bed, and I opened the book. I said, man, these guys, what is, what do you read? And, and I started reading. And I turned the page, and turned the page. And this was like maybe four or five in the evening. In those days, the lights went off at 12 midnight because prior to us getting radios and TV, there was no need for electricity in the cells. So they turn the lights off at 12, so everyone, they say lights off, and that means you carry your butt to bed. So this is four or five in the evening, and I started reading. And I think I know the lights went out. I said, oh, what's going on? And we had no watches. I go to the door, I looked out, so all the lights in the cells were out. I said, oh man, it's 12 o'clock. And I got my book and eased to the door and sat down in the door because the only lights that were on were the lights in the cell block itself. And light from the cell block lights could filter through the bars into the cell. And I sat at the door and let the light filter across the pages where I continued to read until the morning. I said, oh man, it's morning time. And I got up, went to breakfast, got my book. And when the old heads gathered, I went down. I walked up to them, my head, I, I, my eyes expected it. I gave them the book, they said, oh, you read that? I said, yeah, I did, I did. He said, well, tell me something about it. And in my own young, naive, juvenile kind of way, I told him about the book and what I had read and what I thought and what it meant to me. And he just looked at me and he says, that's your spot right there. Can you imagine how I felt? And I looked beyond them and I saw my peers, the guys I congregated with every day, they look and they point and says, look, Irvin's in the cir circle with the old heads. Irvin in the circle with the old heads. And from that moment, they began to emulate my actions. Because I said, man, look, y'all need to read this book. The name of the book that my old head had given me a lot of you have probably read this. It was called Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't read it, then you need to read it. It's uh, by an author, his name was Victor Frankl. He was a psychologist, logotherapist, and his life mirrored mine to the extent that he was locked up in a German Nazi concentration camp during the Holocaust, during the Second World War, in a situation that in terms of its ugliness, its gross inhumanity to man, its darkness, its dangerous its death, dwarfed mine, but mirrored it as well. And what he talked about, I could relate to, and I could not believe the power invested into someone writing a word that hit me in the heart. Next question. Wait, we have a question from the stream. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, Matt from Italy is asking, what is justice? Hmm. Oh, hang on, Matt, Matt. I'm gonna talk to Matt. Matt, Irving could talk for 12 hours. 
on this no, question. I'm going to try to be concise. You're going to do it in 60 seconds, my friend. And we might watch a meltdown here, but this will be good. Okay. Okay. What is justice? Fairness. Mm. In one word, fairness. Rightness. Righteousness. Equity. We hear about justice quite often in our society. But up until this point, justice has just been a word. I work for, oh, I, you guys may not have known this, but I work for Penn State University. That's, oh, wait, that's another story. But I work for Penn State University. I work for the College of Education, Office of Education and Social Equity, and an adjunct that they have, which is called the Restorative Justice Initiative. That's where I work. It's in the Chambers Building, room 113B, and you're all invited to stop over there and holler at me. Stop and see what we're doing. Because we have we're doing a lot of things that could utilize your passion, your energy, your honesty. But yes, justice is what we need to aspire towards in this country. Because there have been wrongs that have been done historically that we need to step to. We need to answer for. We need to we need to address. Awesome. Awesome. And Matt is from Italy. Oh. Um, Hi, Matt. <laughs> uh, I, I do have another question. They're like... Diego. They're like two questions in one. So when you talk about all the books you read and all the knowledge you've acquired, there's something that comes with that um, by consequence, which is the feeling of wanting to see the world around you and that amazement that comes with it. But you're you in prison, that's keeping you behind from doing all that, and it's just... No, no, it's not. No, it's not. Because uh, one thing that you come to realize, especially in my position, my situation where were you there year after year after year, decade after decade after decade? You stop thinking about the world outside of there as being the only world, and you realize that you're still alive. And while you're alive, you have a responsibility to live. And I began to live, not just exist as so many people do, not just in prison, but people out here. A lot of people out here, all they do is exist from day to day, hour to hour. There's no joy in their lives. There's no purpose in their lives. There's no community in their lives. And I began to realize that, look, that the more I learned, the more I read, I mean philosophy, again history, I learned that I, as a human being, have a responsibility. There was an author uh, from the 18, 1800s. His name was John Jacques Rousseau. Uh, he wrote something called The Social Contract. And that showed me that whether I take my signature and put it on a contract saying, this is what I will do as a member of the human Living amongst humankind means that you have a responsibility to live a certain kind of way. You have a responsibility to add to the joys, the beauties, the positiveness of life by virtue of what you do. I don't care if that's outside in the real world, if that's inside the penitentiary. So I began to do that. I began to realize that they may have my body contained, 
but my mind and my spirit was everywhere, everywhere. Again, remember, a ninth grade dropout learning about the Milky Way galaxy, galactic entities, learning about the cosmos, learning about space and time and distance. You talk about blowing a person's mind, going from where we are at in the Milky Way galaxy, of course, which you all know is the galaxy that we, that this solar system resides in, and going to the nearest neighbor, neighboring galaxy, which I believe is Andromeda. Am I correct? Uh, going to Andromeda would take over four and a half years. So, well, I mean, that's not too bad. Four and a half years traveling at 186,000 miles every second, which is the speed of light. The only constant in the universe. Traveling four and a half years at that speed. And that's our closest neighbor. And there are billions, billions, and billions of other galaxies. It blew my mind. Oh. Eric from outside Philly. What changes to the U.S. prison system would be the most productive? Mm. I would say, first and foremost, abolition. Tear them all down. Tear them all down because they are a, 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 a curse to who we are as a people. But realistically, realistically, because we have some people today, we have not grown and evolved to the point where we're all saints, where we're all good citizens, where we're all, as John Jack Roussel so said, adherents to the social contract. So there are places where we're going to have to have people who learn how to live amongst men and women. So, I would like for us to treat, to learn to treat people as human beings. Treat people as human beings. Being young and being in the penitentiary, of course, I'm passionate, I'm ignorant to a large degree, and I want change, I want to do things, so I'm throwing myself as fast as I can against the every brick wall I can to try to do something and I wind up in the hole and you all pretty much know what the hole is. It's a euphemism for solitary confinement. But this is the hole. That cell that I described for you, six by seven, with the bed, the desk, the, no. A mattress on the floor, a dirty mattress on the floor and you have a sheet. There's no bed, there's no desk, there's a toilet over there in the corner in the sink. There's not even a light bulb in the cell. They screw that out and take that out. So this is the hole. And for breakfast, you get three meals a day. You're locked in the hole. You might be in there in a month. You might be in there nine months. You might be in there a year or longer. For breakfast, you're given two pieces of bread and a cup of black coffee. That's breakfast. You get a portion of a lunch, small lunch, minimum. The five o'clock meal at night is two pieces of bread and a cup of black coffee. It's repeated. That's it. After the last meal, when they put that cup in there and they close the door and they lock it, then they'll take a wooden door on rollers across that and roll that across that room and lock that because remember, the only light is the light that filters in from the cell block itself. So with that door rolled across, there's not a speck of light that enters the cell and it's pitch black. And you're in there now from five o'clock that evening when they gave you that last meal 
to six o'clock that morning when you better be standing up at the door like this when they open it for count. So Ir that was the whole. Irvin, so can you just say something though about the, the, so the, I think what you think or what you say is the problem with that is it doesn't give people inside a prison a reason to become better human beings. No, it when doesn't. When people are treated like animals, then they respond like animals. Indeed, indeed, exactly. So this is very much your message that, hey, look, if you want to punish people, then when people leave prison, and almost everybody's going to leave prison. Well, uh, I don't care how many people are in prison. Uh, we began to reduce the populations across the nation, which is a good thing. But still, 95 plus percent of the people that are in prison are coming home one day. And they're coming home not to a colony or society that exists solely for them, but they're coming back to your neighborhoods or your street or to your house. So. The question is that I've been posing and that we oppose at RJI, restorative justice, or that the brothers and sisters on the inside have been asking for years is how do you want us to come home? Okay. Do you want us to come home as we were, worse than we were was when we got here? You want us to come home educated, having learned more about ourselves, about society, about what it means to be a human being. Do you want us to come home with some marketable skills so that we can get a job, so that I can support my family, take care of my, my kids? How do you want us to come home? Because as we're coming home now, we're coming home with so stigmatized that we can't even step out the door without somebody saying, oh, convict, ex-felon, prisoner, give him a job for what? No, no. Then how is he going to survive? How is he going to take care of himself? Let him revert back to what he knows. And he predates again in our neighborhoods. And we become victimized. Is that what we want? It doesn't make sense. So the first thing, of course, would be to treat any and everyone on the inside as a human being. And then doing that, that will lead the way to so many other things. Recognizing with skills or de deficiencies that this human being has that we can work on to develop and change and grow from. We knew, when I marched around uh, in Philadelphia, I meant that uh, a while ago, and I said I was protesting something in Philadelphia as a youngster, and we were protesting the fact that the USSR, which was uh, at that time Russia, what we call the social, uh, you know, socialist, Soviet Socialist Republic, and Red China, had imprisoned over one million each of their own citizens. We thought that was unconscionable. They had each taken one million of their citizens and locked them up. We said, what? Well, today, the United States has over two and a half million people locked up. Over 13 million people on some form of supervision, probation, parole, some sort of restrictive kind of oversight. And people with records that prevent them from even living in certain neighborhoods or getting jobs in certain places. Now, people says, yeah, but they committed a crime. But they paid the penalty for that, did they not? We're starting to push the concept and idea of second chance. If we did not get second chances, probably none of you would be sitting here because you all did something. As human beings, that's who we are. We grow up doing things, making mistakes. But quite often, we're forgiven for those mistakes. We're given second chances. We need to give second chances to people who deserve them. I stand here today as a person sentenced to life who according to the laws was never supposed to be out here because they said I was irredeemable. 
I'm a taxpayer. I vote. I work. In my community, I am known as the, the guy that you come to for the answers. Or if you have problems, go see Mr. Irv. Mr. Irv will take care of it. I live, as I said before, I'm 78 years old. And even though I don't look it, and I don't feel it, because uh, I am in relatively good shape. I have no illnesses. I'm on no kinds of medications. You know, I move about every day doing things. And I live in a senior community where my neighbors are old. And they look old. And they feel old and debilitated. The 52 years that I spent on the inside eating virtually nothing, going to sleep at 9 o'clock, not having anything to drink, not smoking, not eating red meat, not having sex, oh, <laughs> not hanging out <laughs> late hours, which is why I feel the way I feel today. And my neighbors did all the things that I didn't do, so they're paying the price for it now. But if they need someone to move something or need someone to fix something or need someone to go somewhere and pick something up for them, or they, they need some help, need somebody to take the trash out, or do, they come to see me. And I'm older than a lot of them, but they come to see me. You know? So, you gotta move on to the next one. Well, I thought, so what, where's Sam at? What, have you taken Sam's place? Yeah. Is that what's happening? That, yeah. Okay, next, next question. Indeed. Um, so I remember you mentioned like before, like when you were convicted, it was because you're like in some sort of situation where someone else like lost their life. I feel like that's a really like heavy thing to like have like weighing on you. How did you deal with that? And what really were your thoughts on it? Because I know you said it wasn't ever supposed to happen. Oh, so indeed, indeed, indeed. It wasn't on purpose. Um, well, I believe in God. I believe in Right and wrong. I think we all know the difference between right and wrong. We're taught that. I don't care where we're from, what neighborhood we're from, what community we're from. We taught what's right and what's wrong. And I knew what I, what had happened and what had been involved in was wrong. And for a long time it weighed on me. Because first and foremost, my family was ashamed. And usually when we enact something like that, it happens when I, within our own community. So the person who lost their life was actually... A neighbor. I knew this person. And so in my community, I bore that shame. And I did for years and years. And I tried to understand what that meant regarding me as a human being. Was I evil? Was I bad? Was I, as the court said, actually irredeemable? And I did a lot of soul searching. I did a lot of sitting and talking with, with God. Who, who, however we might name this superior and supreme being or whoever we consider designed that same universe that I was talking about because I believe it was a designer. I did a lot of talking with him and with myself. And it took a while, but I came to the conclusion that I was not an evil person. And I meant to show the world, starting with the people that are around me, I meant to show them that I was not. So as opposed to, prison is a place that's oh so negative and so violent, so dark. I understand it. People are frustrated. People are scared, confused. People feel oppressed. People are angry. Was psychotic. And that erupts in speech, action, word and deed. And I promise, if I could not control anything else in my life, I would control me and how I reacted. I took on a mantra which consisted of uh, two different kinds of mantras. Let me explain. 
One was, I said, Lord, and I did this every day, every day. I said, Lord, please don't let me die here. Imagine, 22 years old, and I'm, this is my prayer to the Lord. This is my prayer to God. This is my prayer to the Supreme Being. This is my prayer to the universe. Please don't let me die here. Because I think I'm, I, I deserve something better. That was one, and I did this continually until I was released. I don't say that prayer anymore, but there's one that I said and accompanied with that that I still say till today. Let me be a blessing. That's it. And whatever I do, whatever I do, let me be a blessing. Let someone walk away from my life saying, oh, wow, that was transformative. Wow, that was something I can take with me and take back to my friends, my family. Oh, wow, that put me on the right path. Oh, I am so glad I talked to Mr. Herb. Oh, I'm so glad that Mr. Herb sat and listened to me. Let me be a blessing. And I talk to a lot of people. I talk to a lot of groups. And one of the, last, one of the things that I always admonish them to do in your life, with your friends, with your family, with your loved ones, with strangers in your community, with people that you don't know, is simply be a blessing. Be a blessing as opposed to being a curse. Yes. Because I saw someone inching up. So I said, okay, let me. So we have one more question from Julie. Where's Julie? Where's she at? Where's Julie? Uh, Is she on the camera? Uh, but she's watching us. Oh, Julie, please. Wait a minute, wait a minute. But look, I have to answer this because there's no such thing as a bad question. And this question has a lot of meaning to it. What do you miss about your prison life? And immediately, my first response would be, not a damn thing, nothing. But that's not right. That's not right. My life has been changed because I went to prison. And it was changed not because I was in prison, but because of things that occurred there. I have met some of the most interesting, inspirational, loving, caring, compassionate people in my life in prison. They were prisoners, they were administrators, they were staff, they were nurses, they were people that entered through those unhallowed halls. But they changed my life. I have also met some of the personifications of evil, if you want to say that exists, that exists there, that also exists out here where everything is. And what I miss are the brothers and sisters that I left in there. I miss your brothers or your fathers or your uncles or your neighbors that I left in there that I know need to be standing out here talking to their communities as I do. There was a time in the growth and development of us as a species when before we did anything, we went and sat at the feet of our elders, the wise people, and said, look, I am about to get married. I want to marry this man. I want to marry this woman. What should I do? Or look, 
We're about to rotate the crops, the field. What we planted is dying. What can we do? What should we plant? Or we've grown too large as a visit, as a village, and we need to found another village. Where should we go? Who should we take? What should we do? Or we are about to go to war. What should we do? We went to the and sat at the feet of our elders because they they had the experience. We trusted them, and we knew that they loved us because we were their children. So we listened to them. Hold on, hold on, please, sir. Every one of you has an elder somewhere in your life. If it's not your grandmother, grandfather, older uncles, aunts, could be the neighbor across the way, the old man, the old woman. If not that, the old man or woman that you see on the street corner or in the grocery store. But there are elders all around us who have that same kind of knowledge and wisdom, a reservoir of untapped knowledge and strength. What do we do with that today? Do we do as we did generations ago and venerate that, sit at their feet and say, talk to us, tell us your story? No, we put them in nursing homes. No, we move away from them and may not see them anymore for years. No, we let them die alone. So, one of the things that I ask every audience I talk to is to seek out the elders in your life. Seek out the elders in your family. Seek out the elders in your community. And let them know that you, that you care about them. You want to hear their story. Just ask them, dude, how are you today? Again, be a blessing. Uh, yes. Do y'all know this guy? Huh? If he ever runs for office, elect him, please. Because uh, we need folk like this. <laughs> but yeah, we love listening to your stories, but this guy has been down to ask a question. Oh. But we got to make it short. And you have, you have two minutes to answer this, yeah. Irvin. Two minutes. I don't think two minutes is going to oh, be enough. No, they're, all, they're, they're all ganging One up on me. One last question. They're all ganging up on me. So, you spent 50 years in prison. You finally get out. What then? Well, I'm standing, in front, I'm standing here. I did 52 years in prison. And before I left, I told the brothers and sisters in there that I was going to carry their message out here. Uh, everything I do is an example of what I learned on the inside, example of my perception of life. I am so, so blessed that every day, I've been home three years, three years I've been home. I came home March 26, 2021. And everything that has occurred in my life, there have been ups, there have been downs, there have been obstacles, there have been roadblocks. And at every one of those, I say, Lord, Thank you. Thank you for these opportunities that you've given me. And I do that every day. And I admonish you to do the same things. Because that's life. Life has ups and downs, yins and yangs. The bad things are what hone us and put us to the fire so that we can become better. Look at it that way. There's so many blessings in every one of your lives that you concentrate on the traumatic experiences, the things that hurt, the things that we cower from, without realizing that, oh, every day that you live is another opportunity to be a blessing. So that's my message to everybody, not just you, but everybody that I talk to, is to be a blessing. And I told the guys on the inside, when I, when I got out here, 
I would be talking to you guys and I would mention them. We need to bring some more of those folk home. Thank you, Irvin. Thanks, Irvin. Oh. Oh, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. This is Cora. <laughs> this is my dog, Cora. She spells her name with a K. She's a St. Bernard mix who was, who was three years old, who was horrifically abused. I mean, horrifically abused, uh, psychologically, emotionally, physically. When I first got her a year ago, she could not stand in this room with, with all you folk here and stay there. She would vomit, she would convulse, eyes roll, and she was totally non-aggressive. Stop rubbing on my back. We really gotta go, Irvin. <laughs> we really gotta go, Irvin. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, mm. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we it's, really gotta go. We gotta well, go. ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for welcoming me. I'm sorry to interrupt. All right, y'all. <laughs> quiz is open. If y'all have questions, I'm here. Other than that, if you have like a issue, take your selfie. All that jazz. Have a good weekend. Be safe. Don't do anything stupid. I will.